Hello, college football fans. Welcome to Urban's Take. Urban Meyer, three-time national championship winning coach, and yours truly, Tim May. Urban, looks like this is going to be our last Urban Take of the, Urban's Take of the season. Uh, is it disappointing, or are you pumped up to get into that offseason, my man? No, I really enjoyed it, Tim. First of all, my respect for you, and then uh, the fact we get to talk about our, our Buckeyes and and uh, I think this is one of the really cool things we get to do because it's really football. It's in it's in the locker room type stuff that uh, we get to talk about. So, no, yeah. I really enjoyed it and appreciate it. Oh, well, let's get right down to it. We're going to talk about Ohio State in a minute. TCU and Georgia are playing for it all. Uh, as I as you and I communicated before we started this, these are two teams that have just figured out a way to win in fourth quarters. I mean, Georgia's had a couple of a couple of close calls this year, including that game in Missouri. Came on strong one in the fourth quarter. And of course, the other night, 42 to 41 over Ohio State. What a game. And then TCU, <laughs> you know, a, a team you really discovered about midseason and started taking seriously. But uh, wow, every game they play in some form or fashion has ended up being a, a blockbuster. And then all of a sudden, they come out and just sock Michigan right in the mouth and then hang on Sloopy, right? I mean, uh, uh, these are the two best teams of. Of, of 2022 season, in my opinion, what do you think? Well, we did TCU. I went down to, uh, first of all, Fort Worth, Texas. It's unbelievable. The whole, I've never been there. And the TCU campus was beautiful. The downtown, you know, you got to remember TCU is not new to this. TCU, Gary Patterson built a monster there. Uh, this was one of the, I, in 2014, they were top four. We had to jump up to get into yeah. the playoffs. So he's a great coach. I'm talking about Gary Patterson. He built an incredible program. They have the, as good a talent as anyone within three hours, two hours of their, maybe an hour of their campus. I'm not surprised at all, and especially after being down there. Uh, and then Sonny Dice comes in, and they they run the table here. So the interesting thing, Tim, is that, you know, when you stand next to their team, it's a good team. When they play, it's a great team. Yeah. You know, one way that you can always evaluate talent on a team it's called the nfl draft there's not going to be this is not you know quentin uh, johnson i believe his name is the receiver will be a high pick you know i don't see many other high draft picks uh, i see great players on a great team and reminds me a little bit of our utah team a uh, team that just will refuse to be beat and, and then we did it again at baylor and watched tcu come from behind yeah. and it was over baylor won the game and then TCU does what they do. That Max Duggan, the quarterback, the the mindset of that team. I think that this will be. There should be a movie about this team. And I can they beat Georgia? No, but yes. You yeah. know they can't beat them on the NFL draft. They can't beat them man for man. But can they beat them as a team? I wouldn't put anything past this guy. These guys. Yeah, I was gonna say uh, uh, the the word I the word I use to describe TCU now in my mind is I use the word velocity. They play with velocity, man. They make up, seem to make up for any physical shortcomings by how, by how hard they hit and how fast they get there. And uh, they just seem, seem to have a purpose in mind, both offensively and defensively. And and like you and I talked about, that Baylor game was just a, a beautiful example of them winning that game of calmly running their field goal team onto the, onto the field. The field goal kicker almost walked out there and then, boom, nailed it and uh, on the last play. And – there's something to be said. There's a there's a lot of big time coaching going on there, right? There is, and and then I think when you take a TC a little bit like when we we went to Utah, you know, you're not going to get the five. You're not going to get you know at Ohio State. You're going to get every game. I mean, most every game you're going to line up and you'll be as good or better than any team you play. Yeah. At TCU, that's not the case, and at, at Utah, so I would always say, okay, what's going to be our niche? How do we how do we beat a team that maybe has a little better personnel than we do? And that's where we went to the spread offense. I first went to Bowling Green. And if we would have ran traditional offense, we would have got blown out of the stadium. If we ran traditional defense, we would have blown out of the stadium. TCU runs a 3-3-5 on defense. That's a, but you saw the Wolverines really struggle yeah. with the linebacker run-throughs. It's because it's uncomfortable for the offense line. There's two reasons. Number one, there's no double teams. Number two is it's uncomfortable. They, there's a lot of moving parts, and you saw that right in front of uh, the Wolverines really struggle with that. On offense, the QB, QB run is the equalizer, and that's exactly what they do. So they, Sonny Dykes has not done a great – he's without a question coach of the year in the college football. But yeah. that program, 
it has very good players, great leadership, great character, and a coaching staff that does unique things on offense and defense, give them a chance in every game. And we're going to save you making a pick for this, uh, if in fact you do, till, till the end. But I do want, want to ask you this. What kind of game do you expect, just in a nutshell? I mean, uh, uh, both of these teams would like to get off, obviously, to a big-time start. How critical is that more for TCU, do you think, than it is Georgia? Just what's your take? Yeah, I, I think uh, the Wolverines win that game if they don't throw two pick sixes. I don't think. I think everybody knows that. So you, you just you got to go in the game and not, you know, Georgia's got to take care of the football. Yeah. You know, they got to, you know, they got to establish the run game, take care of the football and not not turn that thing over. Because if this is a clean game, Georgia wins. If it's an unclean game, then TCU you're going to wake up in the fourth quarter and be, my gosh, here they go again. But if it's a clean game, they take care of the ball. Uh Force man-to-man matchups or you know mono mono matchups, they win this game. If it gets sloppy for some reason, the ball's on the ground, they don't block a run through linebacker, he hits the, you know, something happens, then it's gonna be TCU, you know, right in at the fourth quarter. Hey, um, uh, were you proud you were there uh in Atlanta? Were you proud the way Ohio State played or did did a one-point loss, especially the, the way that one developed with Ohio State losing Cade Stover tight end, Marvin Harrison Jr. later uh, in the game, the lab basically at the end of the third quarter, which really changed that game from an Ohio State perspective, uh, the aggressive nature, the uh, approach they took offensively and stuff. But, you know, you know, having shed blood, so to speak, for Ohio State, are you are you proud of the way that team played against Georgia just – what, what do you leave that? What would you leave there that night feeling? Well, first and foremost, Ohio State's not the program for moral moral victories. That, does, that doesn't yeah. happen. It can never that can never happen. However, as a Buckeye graduate and a former coach and a guy that's very close with so many people, Gene Smith and and Ryan Day and and the, you know the team and still I shoot I still have a couple of recruits on that team. I'll tell you their effort was valiant. There it was. I I talked to Coach Day. And I thought there was two coaching jobs he's done that, you know, just as a former coach, just watches. Number one was the Rose Bowl last year. When players opted out, they went against the Utah team that was fully energized, had momentum, and they came back in, in an incredible effort, which is a result of the coach and staff and leaders on that team. They beat Utah. Yeah. I think this follows that. I think what he did after – a bad, a bad day against the Wolverines to have that team ready like they did and play like they did. I don't want to use the word proud because we lost. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, I am proud. I, I thought those players, I was stood right there. You could say, hey, we need you to give a little more effort. When I saw Marvin Harrison Jr. go down and I knew uh, the tight end was out, Stover was out, and my gosh, the best receiver in the country, Smith or Jigbo, didn't play all year. And we have to go a two-minute drive against top five defense. I mean, that C.J. Stroud, that'll go down as one of the greatest games the quarterbacks ever played. Yeah. That's what I was going to get to that, man. Uh, uh, Stetson Bennett and C.J. Stroud showed what they were all about, showed why they were Heisman Trophy finalists. I mean, Stetson Bennett, the guy that Georgia tried to run off and then said, hey, go to junior college and get, and get better, you know, probably figured he'd never come back, you know, but he kept knocking. And, dude, this guy – this guy can win two straight national championships. He can go down as the, in essence, the greatest quarterback from a production standpoint in Georgia history. And boy, in that fourth quarter, he he took you know he took some licks in that game. Fourth quarter, he came up huge, right? I mean, uh, and we already talked about CJ same way. This was a great duel, right? Yeah, I, I mean, you think about how many quarterbacks have gone and won two national championships back to back. He might be. Because that's how you get measured. You know, why yeah. is Tom Brady the greatest? He's one more. He's one. So, I mean, think about this. Stetson Bennett could go down as one of the greatest quarterbacks ever to play the game. If he wins a national championship, back-to-back national titles, he should. Yeah. I stood next to him this first time, and I didn't realize how small that guy is. Yeah. I mean, he – he, I mean, what a winner. What a – but I, I stood there in, in pregame warm-ups, and I, I was almost taken aback. Like, this is Stetson Bennett. And then you watch him play, you watch his command, you watch his competitive spirit. It's incredible. But take a take a deep breath and say Stetson Bennett will go down as one of the greatest court if he wins this game, one of the greatest quarterbacks in college football history. And and deservedly so. Oh, absolutely. I mean, in the clutch, 
he doesn't miss, you know. I mean, he threw some of the stupidest passes you ever saw the other night. But in the clutch, you know, against Missouri when they needed balls on the money, for example, he he stepped up and delivered. Hey, one other guy before we move on, uh, Max Duggan, too. Uh, wow. What what can you say? I mean, there, when a guy puts a team on his shoulders and carries them, I mean, that's saying something, especially in this age, isn't it? You know, we recruited Max Duggan out of Iowa. I went up to see him, and uh, – uh, his father's a high school coach. Yeah. You, you spend five, ten minutes with him. You find out what this guy's all about. And we, I can't remember exactly how it went down, but we went after him. And he, uh, I think, believe he held his his uh, commitment to TCU. And, you know, very real, a high school coach's son, high character, comes from a good family, comes from a rugged program. The chance of this guy being good, it's 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 almost the correlation's almost perfect. You're gonna have a now this good, no one knew this good. But uh Max Duggan, you know, it seems like he's been in college football uh for six years. He might be six years, yeah. I can't remember that. Yeah, but, like Stetson Bennett. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He'll go down in history too. He's a guy that got beat out and stuck it out and the the coaching him and you know, it, it, that's it's really cool to see Stetson Bennett versus Stetson Bennett versus Max Duggan to play for a national title. That gives every young player, you know, with a dream, if the dream can become a reality. Yeah, yeah. Just take your pick. Whoever wins this game, uh, movie. It's already the the movie script's already there, right? <laughs> I mean, just show their highlights. You know, I think Gally Reed go watch that movie. Hey. Uh, Ryan Day, man, he comes out of that game and, uh, you know, uh, he texted me the other day when Kirk Herbstreit indicated that Ryan had told him he's he's uh, going to relinquish uh, play calling duties probably. Good chance he's going to do that this coming season. I texted him to make sure, you know, that was on the up and up. Not that I doubt uh, Kirk, but, uh, yeah, he said he's thinking seriously about it. He hadn't made up his mind totally. But uh, uh, you were there. You were a head coach. You called plays. You did things. Uh, uh, over and above, plus on game day, you had to be on point calling plays, et cetera. What, what kind of burden is that? And, and then I'm going to get into one of the reasons he definitely would like to step back. Step back is not the right word. Step over here and become just almost that classic head coach. Uh, we'll get into that in a minute. But what does that relieve you of uh, from a standpoint of calling plays, that duty? Uh, but does it add more anxiety you know, as the game goes on, why did I give up calling these things? Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, when I became head coach, I, I had a decision to make, whether it be a play, right, primary play caller, because I've always been an offense coach. I knew exactly what I wanted to run on offense, a spread offense. Uh, but then once I got into what I was doing, there's no chance I could do it. You know, the good thing that Ryan Bay came into a program where the infrastructure was recruiting was, you know, they had a great recruiting staff, great weight, weight staff, training staff, academics. You know, I still believe Ohio State's got the best infrastructure in college football. That's good. But, however, uh, I, I talked to Ryan and we had this conversation. He can still be involved with the offense and call plays but not be the primary. That means that's what I was my entire career. When I had Tom Herman at, at Ohio State, you know, I still called probably half the plays, but it was more in a critical situation where – or, or we we were we worked it so well together. I'd say take the shot, or you know, and yeah. and we knew we knew. And same Dan Mullen was with me for a long time as an offense coordinator, and so we were so, you know, we thought alike and we game planned together. But I also went and sat in that defensive room a couple hours a day, and I think what the head coach gives you his presence, especially a guy like Ryan, you know, accountability not not really to the players but to the coaches. You know, he can sit in that defensive staff. That changes the whole dynamic of that room. Yeah. When he's in that room, when he walks over, and, and you've seen teams practice, usually offense is on field one, defense on field two, whatever it is. For him to go spend half that practice over there, it just changes. Yeah. And I think I think, I think, think that's the way college football needs to be run. I, I really do. I don't know how you do it any other way. Well, you know, uh, um, in the press conference after the game the other night, there were only a couple of us guys – who cover our state are in there. So we got to ask multiple questions. You know how much I like that. <laughs> but uh, uh, at the end, uh, you know, I kind of hated to ask this question because CJ Stratt had just had an emotional kind of like answer to a previous question, man, he put his heart and soul in that game. But what I'm getting to is this, 
boy, Ryan Day, you know, you get to that last game and, boy, those gash plays, those explosives, that big long touchdown pass where uh, that got Georgia back into it where a kid fell down. But like I kept saying all year, man, where's that safety deep to at least make a guy turn back, you know, or something. Um, there were some shortcomings to this defense uh, as as aggressive and many times – the way they played the first year under Jim knows there were some shortcomings to this defense that I know cut Ryan to the core. And I think he wants to get, like you just pointed out, he wants to get more of a handle on that. I think you, you get that indication too. Right. And, and being that overseer head coach, as opposed to, like you said, dedicated mainly to the offense, it gives you that ability to eyeball things and then make observations. Right. Yeah, I, I think just the I, I don't think I know this because uh, I witnessed it. And, uh, just his presence will be, you know, to be a primary play caller nowadays, that's a full time job. Yeah. It would be, you know, 15 years ago, it was you could get away with both. But you figure the last coach, I believe, with Jimbo Fisher to win a national title is a primary play caller. You know, think about that for a minute. Yeah. You know, yeah. and then before that, I think it was Steve Spurrier. And think how much it changes game. The game has changed since so I think it was 1996. So it's changed a lot. It's full time recruiting, it's national NIL, it's transfer portal, and it's accountability amongst your coaching staff that everybody's you know from their drill work to what they're doing during practice, and then when they sit in those meetings and watch practice to have the head coach there challenge people, ask questions. You know, I think it's certainly something he's got to consider. I know he is because yeah. first of all, Ryan Day has his head coaching thing figured out. I mean, he's done a ma marvelous job and he's a great football coach, but he also has to adapt. So that's going to be interesting to watch. Hey, real quick, now that you're on the outside looking in to a certain extent, are you stunned by the criticism uh, that Ryan Day got here near the end of the year? I mean, what, you know, you've got to see some of that. I mean, obviously you're in the media now, uh, I don't know. What, what's your reaction to it now that you see how basically visceral people can be and how just to their gut uh, these games seem to affect them in some form or fashion? And why can't you be perfect? You know what I mean? Why, why coach, why can't this team be perfect? I mean, what's what's just your take on that, Urban? Well, I got, you know, one of the best things I did is I'd say 10 years ago or so I got rid of all my social media. You know, I, I have someone who does Twitter for us for, whether it be Fox or whether when I was recruiting, but you know, the, the guy, the people that the nasty world that, you know, social media, I just, I never, I don't read that. So I don't, you know, I'll, I'll hear something maybe in the media. Cause like you said, that's part of my job on big new kickoff is to be aware, but I've not heard the silliness about fire Ryan day or something like that, because I mean, that's why would, why would you read that? Yeah. You know, yeah. why you're just, you know, why would you do that? Uh, the man's 45, whatever his record is, the program strong as can be, as strong as it's ever been. So yeah. I honestly, Tim, I don't get involved with that. I, I try to look, look at the inner workings and you have to stay one step ahead. And I think the conversation, which really is, which I'm glad we're doing this, the conversation is not about some Twitter nut. It's about what do you do to fix big plays on the defense? That's the conversation. And that's what's yeah. going on in Ohio State, not – how do you appease, you know, the guy that, you know, types in some nasty stuff on, you know, or, or maybe, you know, unfortunately sometimes there's media people too. That's why they get paid, I guess, is to say yeah. outland crazy things. And, you know, don't, don't read that. Just, you know, how, how do we fix whatever is broken or struggling? And that's big plays on defense. Yeah. You know, I'm, you know, Jerry Emick, you know, I've known him for a long time and I, you know, we talked about one time with you, I mean, you want pretty much coming across your desk. You want to have a positive approach to the to the day, right? I mean, that, I mean, if you linger on that stuff, it will really just start to eat at you. So, I would think, right? You know, Tim, interesting. I actually told Jerry. I believe it was Jerry, and I said, you know, you know, for the next few weeks, Jerry, all I want is every once in a while throw a positive article on my desk. Yeah. You know, and and because uh, you're right, you know, I don't want to hear about the uh, the player that got in trouble. I don't want to hear about you know, our defense gave up uh, so many yards or we turned the ball over. I, do, I'm not, I know that. And it, you're right. We're all human beings. And Ryan, unfortunately, you know, fortunately, has a very healthy young family. But they have to listen. I guess they have to deal with all that crap, too. Yeah. Yeah. It is what it is at this point. Somebody somebody said that once. 
Uh, you know, I've already asked you about TCU, so I'm just going to jump to this moment of truth thing. Uh, I've loved, I've loved this part of this Urban's Take show, man, is uh, where you just take one moment, you know, and uh, like I wrote down, you know, for this week, uh, you know, uh, none of your national championship games came down to a final field goal, you know. Y'all won, y'all won basically handily when, you, when, when you know in those three national championships. Uh, when you think about it, you know Ohio State's, you know, dream, all the efforts and everything, everything that happened in that game, it finally did come down to making a fifty-yard field goal to win the game or not. Uh, what do you, you know, what, what do you think? Is it is what's a coach? You know, like I said. I'm trying to even think of games that came down well. Obviously, the Maryland game in 2018 came down to them missing a two-point conversion and stuff. But what is going on in your gut when everything, the, the last four or five or eight years you've been recruiting to get to this moment, you've been coaching your rear ends off, et cetera, and it literally comes down to the swing of a leg and uh, and whether that ball goes through the uprights or not. Well, what What is that like? Well, two things. Number one, the checkmate moment to me was when Kirby Smart called timeout when he saw something. That's a good coach. That's someone also, someone upstairs told him something's not right because you can't really see much on the field, but someone said it's not right. On the oh, fake oh, time. Yeah. And that was a that was that was timeout of this century. Yes. The second thing is I did have it one time, I believe the kicker's name was Durbin at uh, he was a former walk on for us in two thousand and sixteen. It was cold. We're playing the top defense in the country, the Wolverines. It's in the uh, right before we go to overtime, and he misses a chip shot field goal. And I saw his fit. And first of all, he's a great kid, great, was a good kicker for us. And he walks off that field realizing what just happened. And I mean, I try to say something to him. He can't. I mean, it's, it's, it's a stone cold look in that player's face. And then if you remember, we got to our second overtime, and analytics said on fourth down and kicked the field goal. And it just played in my mind saying, no, don't do that. I'd rather have JT Barrett with the ball in his hand than, than do that. So it has come down to it. The number, I think this is really important for the fans to just a viewer. The 25-yard line is the line of demarcation that you try to get to because that makes it a 42-yard field goal. Yeah, 42, for the most part, is a manageable field goal. 50s are, you know, you're starting to get into the, you know, 30, 70, 40, 60, 50, 50 at best. When you start hitting 50, under that kind of pressure, a 50-yard field goal in the NFL is much different. In college, a 50-yard field goal is a real one. So I know Coach Dave, was, they were trying, they wanted to get a little more clo you know, closer to that line of demarcation to 25. But, you know, that, us, that right, I, I mean, we were all right there watching that thing. And uh, you can tell he overcompensated and took a real good hard swing at it and, and hooked it. Yeah. Yeah. A, a 40 yarder is, is like a seven or eight iron, uh, a 50 yarder. You feel like you got to pull the four iron out and hit it crisp. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's literally, you've got that. Exactly right. you, yeah. But there's so much room for error. You're, you're exactly right. You want to be, you want to be on the left hash because a kicker has a tendency to draw. It. And if yeah. you're on the right hash, not a good angle for him. So you want to be in the center of the field or left hash with a right footed kicker, because normally they have a draw and, uh, so that's what happened. Yeah, it's real funny. I, I posted a picture because I went back and looked at it. I'm kind of a – I like kickers. I mean, I've always liked kickers, and I've always liked that aspect. And I showed how his foot was just a little bit closer – plant foot was a little bit closer to the ball uh, on the 50-yarder than it was the 48. And, you know, who knows? It might have been put down wrong. We didn't – I didn't really get to talk to him or the the holder on that situation. But just a little bit of difference makes makes a huge difference in the, in the way that ball comes off your foot. And – uh all you do is you got sympathy for the young man and as accurate as he was throughout his uh, stay at Ohio state for two years, he should get another shot at kicking field goals somewhere. Uh, so, hey, Herman. Hey, a uh, quick history, yeah. quick history lesson for you, Tim, 1986 against the team up North. A yeah. kicker did the same thing. Who was Matt it? France. Matt, Matt France. France. And as I always remind people, the, the, the uh, goalposts were six feet wider back then, you know, and, uh, 
And do you remember in that game, uh, the, the the Monday of that game, a guy named Jim Harbaugh, uh, a guy named Jim Harbaugh uh, basically guaranteed victory, and that's what it took. <laughs> Ohio State missing the I remember field. Like, so it's crazy, I man. It was like yesterday. Yeah. Hey, uh, it's the last Urban's take uh, for the season. I've really enjoyed doing this. So let's go out with a bang. Uh, I think, uh, like you indicated a while ago, if Georgia doesn't step on its own foot, Georgia should hold sway against TCU in this national championship game. Both of these quarterbacks with Cinderella, well, Stetis DeBiz had two Cinderella seasons, but Max Duggan, what he's done, um, who do you like in this game? If Georgia does not turn the ball over Georgia by 10 or maybe 14, uh, Georgia turns it over. I think it'll be a street fight, but I just think the coaching staff, I, you know, Kirby's built a national championship program and that's not by accident. He's got coach, coach Munkin on the, on offense, yeah. Will Muschamp on defense, two excellent coaches. They're going to keep the ball in front of them. They're going to tackle the quarterback on offense. I imagine they're going to have three straight days of turnovers, you know, where they practice. You know, make, you know, just make sure you take care of that ball and you teach that quarterback, don't force a throw. If it's not there, throw it away, burn it, and live to see the next day because TCU could win this game if you turn it over. If they you do not, I don't believe TCU can win the game. Herman, can I ask you one last thing? You know me. I've always got one more question, but I do want to ask you this. Uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. gets knocked out of that game the other night with the concussion protocol is what it was. Uh, Kate Stover lands on his butt after trying to hurdle a guy. Next thing you know, uh, he's got back spasms, and he's he, they take him to the hospital. Everything checked out, but he was dealing with a little back spa, lower back spasm thing there. You saw Darnell Washington, Georgia's one of Georgia's other two tight ends, leave the game uh, and didn't return. He's questionable this week for this game. Uh, can a, can major college football teams make it through three straight games of that magnitude and be anywhere close to whole? And that's what's coming. Uh, when you get to the 12 team and some team, if it, if it gets, if it's in that first round and wins and gets to the championship game, we'll, we'll play four games of that magnitude physically, et cetera. This is going to take a toll on college football rosters, isn't it? In 2014, we played 15 games. We had the starting, uh, one of the things we're very proud of with coach Marotti, our sports performance team, we had zero soft tissue injuries that year. Yeah. The same starting 11 from game one, was in game 15, other than JT Barrett. That's right. Because he broke his leg, you know. And so the answer to your question is, if Ohio State, if we didn't have the same starting 11, you know, that think about that. The five starting offense linemen started every game. Yeah. And so to answer your question, we would not have been national champions without that. That, that wouldn't have happened. If you would have lost, you know, think about they lost their two top receivers. Our top two receivers were Michael Thomas and Devin Smith. Yeah. No, no chance. We're not winning that game. You know, you take uh, our tight ends, Jeff Hireman, out of the game. We're not winning that game. You take Zeke Elliott, it's a set match. It's We don't win that game. So to answer your question, you're going to – it's going to be really hard, you know. And it's – I just take that it's really hard on the players. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's Urban Meyer. I'm Tim May. Urban Meyer, three-time national championship winning coach. Tim May covered two national championships at Ohio State. Uh, I really enjoy this time of the year when everything's on the line. You do too, don't you? I do. I uh, I appreciate uh, what those current student athletes are doing, the current coaches, and I also text some of my guys that played for me. You know, I, Cardell Jones. I called him one day when I was watching this, going, "Do you realize what you did? Yeah, exactly. you know, you're a national champion, and he's he's a legend at Ohio State. He should be." And then I talked to some of the other guys. I see. I called Zach. You know, Zach Warren, and I said, "Do you realize you started this?" If we don't go 12 and 0, Zach, that Ohio State's not in this. You did this. You, yeah. Your leadership, you know, you flipped that switch on the Ohio State program and kept it going. And I'm just great, you know, so appreciative of those great players and great coaches we had. Well, Urban, thanks for joining me, man, these weeks uh, during this season. I've really enjoyed this because I, I like talking football <laughs> about as much as uh, it breathing. And, and I, I, I get, I almost go into a little bit of a funk when college football season is over because it's been so much of my life, man, since I was since I was five years old and growing up in Alabama and stuff. And I know, hell, it made your life, man. And uh, uh, but I've really enjoyed this, my man.
Well, let me know if you want to do one in uh, spring recruiting or, you know, in uh, summer training camp. Let me know. We'll do another. You got it. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Urban Meyer. I'm Tim May. And until you see us next, we'll see you then.